Hello, and welcome to our Tech Talk webinar series. This is week two of a five-week virtual mini-series on startup equity opportunities. This mini-series will help you learn what investors are funding, how to protect your IP, different equity funding options, and how to build a strong founding team. Talk Tech webinar series is brought to you by the SBDC at UCI Beale Applied Innovation. The SBDC is funded in part by the U.S. Small Business Administration and the State of California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development and other sources. The SBDC is here to help you start, grow, and succeed in your business by providing no-cost expert consulting and training such as this fantastic webinar series. A little housekeeping before we begin. Everyone is muted during the webinar. All webinars will be recorded and sent to all attendees after the webinar has concluded. Once the webinar concludes, a brief survey should appear. We would love your feedback and would also like to know what other topics you're interested in learning about. Tomorrow, the recorded webinar will be sent to all participants. A PDF copy of the slides will also be included in the Dropbox link. There will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to ask questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Once the presentation concludes, I will ask the questions presented in the Q&A box or the chat feature. I may not get to everyone's question, but we will do our best. If, you don't get to your, if we don't get to your questions, please email khaled H at uci.edu. This week, we have the pleasure of hearing from Bardia Moyeda. Bardia has significant experience representing companies and financial firms in a broad range of general corporate governance and transactional matters, including venture capital financing, mergers and acquisitions, debt offerings, spin-offs and divestitures, joint ventures, IPOs, follow-on offerings, and tender offerings. Today, Bardia will be giving you an overview of equity, equity funding options, legal financial risks, and structures such as safes, convertible notes, seed, and series A. It'll also answer where to start, which structure is best for you, and how to safeguard as best you can. Thanks for speaking to us today, Bardia. I'm gonna be turning it over to you now. Great, thank you. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Bardi Amoyedi, and uh, we've already gone the intro, so we can dive right in. Uh, today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of start with just the initial uh, capital fundraising questions or uh, concepts and where that initial source of capital will come from. And then we'll kind of dive into the nitty gritty of the terms that you'll usually see, whether it's with a convertible note, a safe, or if you're gonna raise an equity round, be a series seed or series A preferred stock finance round. So the initial question, jump ahead. The initial question is usually, you know, where will I get the money and how much money do I need? So typically, uh, this is the most common question that we, we usually get. How do we get this money? Who am I gonna raise the money from? And as far as how much money do I need, you know, do I take as much money as I can? Or do I you know, just take as much money as I need at this point to reduce dilution, to give up the less amount of stock or less amount of interest in the company, and then use that little money that I take to get to the next inflection point, and then I try to raise money. Um, these are the kind of the, the most typical issues that our founders kind of run into. And with respect to the advice I usually like to give is, uh, I probably fall in the school of thought of, you know, take as much money as you need don't take all the money that's available to you just because it's available. The idea is take as much funding as, as will be required to get you and that company and your company to the next inflection point. Okay, so who are we gonna be raising money from? That was the first question. Usually the financing sources at the initial stages are friends, family, and you'll of course hear fools. So who are these fools? These are typically angel investors. We'll, we'll stop calling them fools from now going forward, but uh, angel investors are usually high net worth individuals who 
uh, have done some kind of investing in startups in the past, or they had a startup themselves and they've exited and they're coming and they're thinking about investing in a venture that you have now started. Another great place to get money is of course, friends and family. And we'll talk about you know, how that works and the risks of raising money from accredited versus non-accredited investors, which we'll get into. Uh, that's a securities law term. There are incubators and accelerators. For example, right across the parking lot from UC Irvine's uh, Cove is Evo Nexus. And Evo Nexus, uh, where, where they might give you, they might not give you investment funds, they'll give you space and consulting and things like that. Uh, some, some incubators like Y Combinator will actually give you $150,000 in exchange for a certain percentage of the company. There is, of course, venture capital money, which was a little bit harder to get uh, at the initial stages, but it certainly will come in on your second stage, let's say if that's a Series A. There are strategic investors. Those are corporations that have set aside money in a corporate venture capital fund or otherwise to invest in startups that they think would add a huge benefit uh, in their realm of technology to their company. There's a concept of venture debt and commercial banks. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly, but I'll, I'll do most of that here. Venture debt is essentially, uh, there's a few banks out there that have decided to lend on startups, not based on the traditional, you know, how much revenue do you have coming in? What's, you know, what's, what's your balance sheet look like? It's more on, hey, we will give a startup a loan, given the fact that, you know, you don't have too many sales, but what we want is a warrant, basically an option to purchase stock uh, in your startup as in exchange for giving you a loan. Commercial banks, you're gonna have a, you know, like Wells Fargo, uh, First Republic, things like that, you're gonna have a hard time raising actual money from if you don't have substantial sales. And then of course, there's government grants. So uh, SBIR, there's NSF, and uh, uh, there's more, more of that to come. Okay. So some of the terms that you'll generally hear very early on is, you know, sweat equity or bootstrap. What does that mean? So for sweat equity, basically what it means is that founders and the initial employees are going to receive stock, shares of stock in exchange for any of the IP and the time and effort that they put into developing the business. These founders are usually um, bootstrapped, so to speak, they're bootstrapped, so to speak, because you aren't taking in any kind of outside funds at that initial stage. We talked about the concept of accredited investors, you know, friends and family. So one thing that's really important to understand is, is that securities laws, the federal securities laws basically say that if you're going to raise money from anybody, whether it's friends or family or an angel or whoever, that that money needs to come from usually from an accredited investor. So who is an accredited investor? That's someone who has at least a million dollars, you know, outside the primary residence in their home or their primary equ the equity in their primary home, or who has, you know, at least $200,000 of income in the last uh, two years. And they have that expectation to have to make $200,000 or more in this next year. For uh, married couples, that number actually goes to like 300,000 as opposed to 200,000. Uh, those are accredited investors. If you're raising from somebody who's an accredited investor, then you don't have an issue typically with securities laws, meaning you can, you can raise money from them and it's no problem. One of the questions we usually get is, well, hey, one is, I don't know if, I have, if this person is an accredited investor. How do I know? Well, typically, if you are going to be raising a fundraising round, you can, if you speak to an attorney, they, have, you know, they can prepare for you a accredited investor questionnaire. And it's basically a questionnaire that kind of asks these similar questions. It's like a check the box. Hey, Mr. Investor or Mrs. Investor, do you have you know, a net worth of at least a million dollars outside the primary equity, uh, equity in your primary home? Or are you making the 200K or more? Uh, and certain other boxes that might need to be checked. Now, what if, you know, what if you're going to raise money from your uncle or your, your aunt or whoever, and you know, they might not be accredited investors? It could even be your neighbor. Well, what the securities laws say is, okay, you can, you can raise money from non-accredited investors, but the question that you have to ask is, or that the SEC and the federal regulators want you to ask is, you know, are these investors sophisticated? 
You know, and so under the securities laws, there's no strict definition of what constitutes a sophisticated investor, right? And so if you, the guidelines that we've received, if you see those guidelines that we've received from, you know, the federal regulators, it basically says, in order for somebody to become a sophisticated investor, if they're not accredited, you have to give them enough information to where they can make the reasonable decision to invest in your startup or not, given that your startup is a very, very risky venture. So that usually include, in, entails, you know, including you know, risk factors in a term sheet saying, hey, you might lose all your money by investing in my company. It'll say, you know, it'll be disclosing financial statements. It'll be disclosing uh, customer contracts and agreements and, and revenues and things like that so that they have enough information to quote unquote become sophisticated. Now, because there's no bright line taste, bright line, bright line test on sophistication, it's you know, it's it's usually iffy, and we usually recommend to not raise money from anybody who's not an accredited investor. Now, practically speaking. A lot of our startups will raise money from friends and family who are not accredited and who debatably may or may not become sophisticated. The advice is do your best to give them as much information as possible to make them sophisticated. Uh, and at the same time, you know, practically speaking, you know, know your audience, know, know who your investor is. And so if you're going to take $25,000 from your mom to start your new startup and she's not accredited, an accredited investor, the practical uh, point I would make is, is she going to sue you for, you know, not, you know, for, for something like not having all the information that's necessary. Okay. Moving on to angels and super angels and crowdfunding. So the traditional angel is a high net worth individual who's got uh, money kind of set aside as we discussed to, to invest in some of these early stage companies. Uh, there are also large groups of traditional angels that have now kind of come together and they will kind of co-invest. One, one of those organizations is uh, Tech Coast Angels here on the West Coast. And actually, actually that would fall more on the San, uh, angel groups kind of subsection. There's also Sand Hills Angels, Golden Seeds, and some other ones. These are, what's good now about these, and Tech Coast Angels just changed their, uh, their structure, but what's good about these uh, angel groups is that they are now centralized so that you don't have to go out to each individual angel. You can just go approach one of these big groups and it's all centralized and you can have you know, one investment process through the angel group. There is also something called angel list where companies can go on this website. Uh, if you Google angel list and you can post your executive summary or propose term sheet. And then it's just a waiting game. You have to wait to see if anybody kind of shows interest and whether they want to invest. There are quote unquote super angels and micro VCs. Super angels will be kind of, you know, not, not, not your traditional angels, the ones that have, you know, a lot more money and are usually billionaires. So think Mark Cuban or anybody else that's on Shark Tank. These folks are considered super angels or micro VCs because usually they'll take the entire round uh, or they'll write you a much larger check. There's also the concept of crowdfunding, which is re uh, recently, you know, just recently came about in the last few years under the Jobs Act. Crowdfunding is you're selling a small amount of equity to a number of investors. Think of it as Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but instead of giving them a, you know, uh, product, you're actually giving them equity. The problem with crowdfunding is that even though it's, you know, the regulations have kind of loosened on, on uh, raising money from non-accredited investors in this scenario, because with crowdfunding, you're getting investment from regular retail investors. There's still a lot of administrative costs because of the number of people that will be on your cap table. And there's actually some reporting requirements that make it maybe not as cost efficient cost efficient as some of the other options like raising money from traditional angels or angel groups. Okay, we talked also about incubators and accelerators and how that works. So incubators like Y Combinator and some of the other ones uh, will make a one-time small investment in the companies that they accept into their program. There's an application process, it's generally not that easy to get into these incubators, but I always encourage everyone to apply because even if you don't make the first cut, 
and you don't get in, you can reapply for the next class. But also, you're, you're getting exposure to your idea and your company, and you're getting practice on pitching to some people who are pretty notable uh, in the startup community. If you get accepted to these incubators, uh, they will fund you. Some of them will fund you, and it ranges from 15000 to 150000 and in exchange for a percentage of equity in your company. So for Y Combinator, they have this standard, we'll give you 150 grand, but we also want 7% of your company. Um, the investment structures vary. For Y Combinator, for example, they will give you a safe that represents the 7%, or they'll ask for a safe that represents that uh, in combination with the common stock purchase agreement. Some incubators will ask for preferred stock, like a Series C preferred stock, and some might ask for convertible notes. With the incubators, the investment terms are generally standardized, so you're not going to have much of a chance to negotiate. So, for example, you're not going to be able to say, hey, Y Combinator, I want to give you 5% instead of 7%. What's great about incubators is it gives you access to advisors, to VCs, strategics, and some of these super angels, folks that are hopefully going to be tailored to what you are doing. Uh, or have industry knowledge in what you're doing and can provide some good access to not just knowledge, but people and funding and uh, all kinds of other resources. Incubators are also good because they can actually help you get discounts and credits towards some services like, for example, law firms. Um, we have a partnership with SBDC, Troutman does, uh, and UC Irvine's Cove. Uh, you get some discounts on Amazon Web Services, Rackspace, PayPal. All these things can add up, and it's actually good to you know, try to pinch every penny and save all the money you can up front. It's also very good to know that most of these incubators are funded by VC firms and super angels. So again, if you can get into one, it's generally recommended. All right, so who are these VCs anyway? Well, if you actually go to vcstarterkit.com, Anybody can become a VC. You just get to purchase this little package here. You need a Patagonia vest, some Albert shoes, and a couple of subscriptions to Wine Spectator and some of these other things. But uh, joking aside, VCs are long-term investors who take a pretty active role in the portfolio companies that they invest in. VCs are serious investors. They don't usually expect a return on that investment that they make for about seven to 10 years on average. Generally, that exit to them looks like a uh, M&A deal, so a merger or acquisition where you're being purchased uh, by another company, or you're going public uh, through initial public offering, so an IPO. Uh, you know, think, think we work, although that IPO didn't go through. So VC firms, so you know, are typically structured as uh, what's called a limited partnership and it, with one or more funds managed by a group of investment professionals. Those, those professionals are called general partners. One good thing, uh, or one thing to know, one good, good point to know about VCs and their VC funds is that they, um, they have their own uh, LPs or limited partners who are, who are investors in these funds. And these are typically bigger kind of, bigger money. So pension funds, insurance companies, endowments from universities, family offices, and high net worth individuals. Another important point to know is that the partnerships, the, L, the limited, the LP, which is the fund itself, is a pass-through entity pretty similar to an LLC. In other words, there's only one layer of tax. And so many times, as a condition to making an investment in your company, a venture fund will say, hey, we see that you're an LLC. We don't want to invest in an LLC because that's going to that's gonna mess with our pass-through structure, tax structure that we have as a limited partnership. The LLC is a pass-through, the partnership is a pass-through, so presumably everything can pass through up into the limited partners who are invest investors in the fund. So what the venture fund will say is, before we invest, or as a condition to investing, we'd like you to convert from an LLC to a C corporation. You can't be an S corporation because an S corporation is also a pass-through. Um, so one of the questions we frequently get is, hey, should I start my company as a C-Corp? Should I start my company as an LLC? Should I start my company as an S-Corp? What should I do? Generally speaking, it's, you know, to save the headache down the road, I would say most startups start as a C-Corporation. 
That way there is no uh, issue that, that might come up with respect to VCs or anybody else, any sophisticated investor who might demand that you convert from an LLC to a C Corp. Uh, with respect to S Corps, you actually can't have entities invest in an S Corp. So your S Corp status actually gets blown. You become a C Corp automatically uh, if anybody takes an ownership in your company with, with, uh, with an entity like an LLC. So what do the fund sizes look like for these, for these venture capital firms? Well, there's, it ranges from micro, 25 million to 50 million, all the way up to mega funds, so, such as you know, in the billions. So the new Enterprise Associates Fund 17, which recently closed, that's at $3.6 billion raised. So there's a lot of capital to deploy there. VCs also, you should know, typically focus on investments in a particular stage of the company, whether it's seed stage, early or late stage. And they also focus on certain industries like B2B SaaS companies, consumer, biotech, clean tech, and the list kind of goes on. So if you're approaching venture capital investors, try to, try to approach venture capital investors in your range, in your uh, sector. What are they looking for? They are looking for you know, the product, technology, and the market potential. So there's, again, there's two kind of schools of thought. The VC is looking at whether they're gonna, you know, are they, gonna, are they investing in, are they backing the horse, so to speak, or are they backing the jockey? Uh, the horse would be, in this scenario, the, you know, the company, the technology. Is the, is the technology so good and so disruptive that me as the VC, I, I see the opportunity here and I need to invest? Um, think Uber, right? Uber, the technology was so good that, you know, so the horse was so good that, you know, the VCs invested. But the jockey, for example, uh, Travis Kalanick, you know, didn't, it didn't really work out with him. So obviously the confidence probably was in the technology and not the management team. So VCs typically, they invest in what's called preferred stock. Some will do safes and convertible notes, but not many. And you'll see that the, depending on the stage focus of the VC, whether it's an early stage or late stage, uh, that'll kind of drive what structure they ask for when they invest. VCs will also typically ask for one or more board seats, some voting rights, and also some you know, operational pre-approval rights and things like that. The reason for this is the VCs are putting in usually large checks and they wanna have some say in how that money is used and they want to make sure that the company is kind of on track to keep growing the way it is, the way it needs to. VCs also expect to make follow-on investments in portfolio companies. So whether that's through another convertible note or uh, through another equity financing, you'll hear the term you know, pro rata rights or preemptive rights. That's, those are rights where the VCs will want to at least participate pro rata, but then also they're going to want to lead probably your, your, next, your next round if they invest in your initial rounds. And like we discussed, VC firms, how do they make money? They make money when, when you exit. So whether, whether you go public or whether you sell your company, uh, that's, how they make, that's how they make a return on their investment. So some quick statistics for you all, not to discourage you, but so VCs receive an average of 200 executive summaries every month. Less than 5% of those you know, will be invited, less than 5% of those folks will be invited to meet with the VC partners. 2% reach the due diligence phase, and then less than 1% will be offered a term sheet, okay? 0.3% of those, after submitting the executive summary, will ultimately obtain the VC funding. So don't get discouraged. It just means that there's a lot of competition out there. Luckily, capital over the years has also increased the availability of the capital, of money to be invested. So my, my, my goal for you guys is not to just go and try to seek the first round of funding from a VC, Build it up, build up your product, go find angel money first, go find incubator help first, and get to a point where when you submit your executive summary, it's gonna be noticed. Okay, so we talked about just regular venture firms, but there's also strategic partners or corporate venture capital. So these are generally larger companies that are in the same industry as you, and they're looking to make a strategic investment in what, you know, what they consider to be their realm or technology that they find that they might want to get into down the road. Something that's going to complement their own growth. So 
just because you know you don't see a big company with a venture capital arm kind of standalone like you see below in this in this slide like intel capital or qualcomm ventures doesn't mean they don't exist there's a lot of companies out there who actually will make venture capital kind of investments they don't necessarily do it through like the qualcomm ventures are you know the, the ventures arm of their company these uh, strategics you should know also, they, they basically kind of ask for the same terms as traditional VCs. They also might ask you for a license or a marketing or distribution arrangement. What they're trying to do is, you know, they see a potential in your product and they want to be able to use that product themselves. And actually, it's always, you know, it's generally a good idea to have a strategic partner invested in your company. It's many times that these strategic corporate partners will down the road, look at your company and say, hey, we really like the product. We like, you know, that's why we made the investment. You've, you've grown it, you've developed it. We actually want to be the ones that acquire you. We want to buy it. And so you'll see that strategics can provide a very valuable um, piece to your company. Okay, so which one do I choose? Do I go with the incubators? Do I go with the angels, the VCs, the strategics? What's, you know, what's the advice? Incubators are really good. If you want to get a kickstart and exposure to a lot of folks and a lot of advisors, we don't mind giving away like a relatively large piece of the company early on. We talked about one to 10% for probably a small investment or you know, office space or access to these advisors, then an incubator is good. If you only need smaller amount of capital and you don't want to give away control, but you're willing to herd the cats, so to speak, meaning you're like you're trying to round up all these small investors to get your angel round your note or safe round done and approach the angels for vcs it's pretty hard we talked about how hard it is to kind of attain vc funding and uh still though if you can get in front of some of them and you have a need to raise a significant significant amount of capital early on and you want that kind of guidance expertise you should pursue the vc strategics are good if you need the cash and you want to form a large you know form a relationship with a large player in your industry Again, it's not which one should I choose of all these four. It's more, you know, let, let me go at all four of these and see which one actually gets me the opportunity that I need for my company. Okay, so very quickly, we'll talk about kind of commercial bank loans. Uh, and that's, we're gonna gloss over the next few slides pretty quickly here, but for commercial bank loans, the traditional bank doesn't really loan to you unless you've got you know, a few years of ARs coming in, accounts receivable, and you're selling product. So try to stay with, I guess, try, try not to waste too much of your time on commercial bank loans. Okay, uh, venture debt. Venture debt, there's certain banks out there like Silicon Valley Bank or Bridge Bank that will uh, extend money as lines of credit and give loans to small startups uh, in exchange for a warrant, basically to purchase stock in their company. Essentially, they're asking for the upside of an equity piece. So the sweet spot range of funding for a venture debt kind of bank is they'll give you about $3 million to $6 million, usually on a three-year term. It could be a line of credit or it could be a straight loan, like a term loan. But they will they are very you know they'll, they're they're very careful with who they give money to and this might not be an early access kind of available uh source of capital for you so that being said you know keep this in mind for future rounds especially after you raise you know maybe your first your first uh big equity round okay let's talk about investment structures so we talked about you know where that money comes from the sources of capital and now we want to talk about how do i structure that investment that's coming in so there is there is uh equity which is actually stock that's being sold those are actually ownership interests in the company at this time so if you start a new company you're going to have common stock you're going to have ownership in that on the company based on a percentage then there is non equity uh instruments kind of like convertible debt or safes Convertible debt, convertible note, those are interchangeable terms. So convertible notes and, and safes, these are debt or instruments that convert into preferred stock in a future round of financing, a future equity round. 
So when you do your Series A, these notes or these safes will convert into this uh, preferred stock or whatever you sell in that equity round down the road. They're called bridge loans or bridge financings because it basically bridges you from you know, your, your first angel round to your next round of, of capital raise. The benefits of going through a convertible note or a safe round is that it's pretty quick, it's simple, and it avoids the need to do a priced equity round when you don't know exactly what your company's value is. And it's hard for you to, or it's, for, it's hard for you to tell if how much your company has increased in value from the prior round. Uh, if you're an early stage company, it's, it's you, you know saves and notes are generally even more advantageous to you because you you know how how do you value your company uh, as of today when you have been in existence for about six months and you don't have much other than a prototype or a business plan. The last thing you want to do is set a valuation too low and give away you know 50% of your company. So saves and notes when they convert they convert at a discount or they have a valuation cap that applies when it converts into the into the stock and we'll talk about that in the next few slides and they can either be convertible into you know series a preferred stock that's issued in the future or it can be converted into kind of you know existing stock that's already on you know it's already been authorized uh, in your company charter today the notes can also be secured or unsecured and that usually depends on the stage of your company secured note basically means that the investor if you ever were to default, basically not make you know make the payment that's needed at maturity on your convertible debt on your convertible note, then the investor can actually foreclose on your assets. That the note is actually secured by the assets, the IP of your company. Convertible debt that's secured is usually given kind of between like the Series A and Series B stage. It usually happens in the later stages of financing. It also is you know, influenced by certain market factors. Are you having a down round? Is your valuation going down? Is there more risk now to your company than there was before? Equity, when you're gonna raise money uh, from, from uh, some of these folks, they might say, we don't wanna do a new convertible debt deal. We don't wanna do a safe deal. We actually want equity ownership in your company. Very rarely will they say, hey, we'll buy common stock. There's no special rights to common stock and that's usually why. And very, very uh, frequently they'll say, if we're gonna do a deal, we're gonna give you investment dollars. We wanna buy preferred stock. The preferred stock, there's special rights that are in your articles of incorporation or your certificate of incorporation, also referred to as your charter, and also in the financing docs. So there's certain rights, preferences, and privileges. These are premium rights uh, that are not afforded to common stock typically. Okay, so convertible note financing. What is a convertible note financing? Uh, it's a short-term loan to the company. We talked about this for very briefly in the last couple slides. And investors usually purchase a promissory note from the company with this given principal amount and an interest rate. Uh, and then there's a maturity date that's you know, 12, to 12, 12 to 24 months out, meaning the loan, the loan or the note becomes due you know, 12 to 24 months from the investment date. Now, typically, a lot of questions we get is, hey, what if I, can't pay back the loan, what if the company can't pay back the loan in 12 months, what happens then? Well, hopefully, you know, between the investment, that you, the date that you take the investment and the 12 to 24 month, you know, due date, maturity date, you've raised some, you know, you've raised what's called a qualified financing and the note has converted into that qualified financing round where you sold equity, such as Series A preferred stock. If it hasn't happened, it's not, typically the end of the world. The reason that's the case is because investors aren't gonna, if you don't have the money to pay the company back, the company doesn't have the money to pay the investors back, the investors generally will not foreclose on the loan. They're not gonna basically say, hey, we're gonna pay us back. Oh, you can't pay us. We're gonna force you into bankruptcy. If they do that, they're basically gonna be out everything. So what they generally do is, they'll, you know, the company will approach the investors and say, hey, can we extend our note for another 12 months, because if we think in another six to 12 months, we should be able to get some equity round of financing, or we're gonna have a better product or whatever else that's gonna give us some better market opportunity. Uh, what's the interest rates on these like convertible notes? It usually ranges about 68, 68% per year. Um, and I think I would say this has been a fairly typical standard for the last few years now on that range. 
So as we discussed too, these, these loans, this convertible debt will convert into equity upon a qualified finance. Meaning once the company raises, let's say a million dollars or more, for example, in a series A preferred stock round in the future, the convertible note will convert at usually a percentage discount. So, you know, 10 to 30% is a, is a typical discount um, with 15 to 20% being the current market norm off of whatever the purchase price was that was paid by the Series A investor. And we'll walk through an example of that in one of the next slides. You should know that sophisticated investors will usually ask for not just a conversion discount percentage, but also what's called a valuation cap. Valuation cap is basically saying, hey, you're gonna, the investor says, hey, you're gonna take my money and you're gonna, you're gonna use it to take the valuation of the company so, you know, higher, but, if you take it too high, it actually counts against me because I'm gonna convert into that stock at that high valuation. A 15 to 20% conversion discount might not give me the full benefit of you know, the risk I'm taking on now. So let's set an upper ceiling on what that valuation looks like for me as the investor. Let's say a $10 million valuation cap would mean that if the company raises money above a $10 million valuation cap, um, the, the convertible note will convert you know, at 10 million rather than let's say a 20 million valuation. Sometimes warrants can be issued in lieu of the conversion discount. We've been seeing less and less of this kind of over the years. And what happens to the company, well, you know, what happens to my, to the notes if the company is, you know, acquired before the notes convert? If the investor is sophisticated, they'll ask for a premium payment. So they'll ask for all their principal and accrued interest back, but also maybe, you know, 1.5 or 2x on their money if you're actually sold before they're able to convert. Okay, conversion discount. So here's the example that we were uh, gonna run through. So remember the conversion discount is a discount to the price per share paid by the investor in that qualified finance, qualified financing being your series. So for example, if an investor holds a note for $100,000, including the interest, with a 20% conversion discount, and then in a qualified financing that happens, you know, six months from now, shares of Series A preferred stock is sold at a dollar per share to a VC, the note would then convert at 80 cents per share into, into the Series A. So you take $1 and you subtract 20%, which is 20 cents, and you get the 80 cent per share conversion price. So the investor would receive in this scenario, 125,000 shares of Series A preferred stock, compared to 100,000 shares received by the new Series A investor for the same amount. Remember, the Series A investor pays a dollar per share. They get 100,000 shares uh, for a $100,000 investment. Because we got that discount, as the investor, the investor would get 125,000 shares. Okay, so how do I set my conversion discount? What do I do? Typically, the range that we talked about is 10 to 30%. 15 to 20% discount percentage off of the Series A purchase price is, has become kind of the norm. 20% is probably the most standard. Uh, if you're a company and you're going out for investment, you know, start out with the lower end of this, right? The less of a discount you give, the less of a dilution that happens to you down the road. Uh, so if you start at 10% or lower, uh, you might actually get, you know, you're gonna get, might get some pushback from the investors and you're gonna have to adjust based on investor interest kind of go up you know don't don't give too much of a discount if once you start going above 30 percent you're kind of getting out of what market terms are uh the last thing you want to do is give with you know like a 60 70 percent discount uh to the series a purchase price and you should know you know so when setting this you know as the time increases between the investment and and like the qualified financing the discount might increase this is a mechanism that a sophisticated investor might ask for right if you're going to take longer with my money there's, there's more risk to it, I want a bigger discount. For you guys as a company, you know, the investor wants to incentivize you to do a you know, quicker qualified financing and uh, they wanna get some more benefit to being an, an early investor in your bridge round. So what kind of factors should you look into when you set this discount? Look at the market terms that we just discussed. Think about you know, what's, the, what's the time of the qualified, the length of time of the qualified financing? Like, is your series A gonna happen? a year from now or two years from when you take the initial uh, real note money or longer uh, is, you know, can I entice someone to give me more time by giving them a bigger discount? 
uh, how risky is your, is your business? Uh, and ultimately, it comes down to investor appetite. Investor appetite will drive the terms. Okay, what about that more sophisticated term, the valuation cap? How do I set my valuation cap? First of all, what is it, right? So um, no, the no convert set a price determined by dividing the valuation cap by the company's fully diluted shares just before the Series A financing. And we're gonna walk through an example of that. As a company, you wanna aim to have a higher valuation cap. That's you know, somewhat near or close to what you anticipate your Series A valuation being. You don't wanna give a too low of a valuation cap because let's say, and we'll see this in our, in our example, but if you give too low of a valuation cap, um, say you give a $5 million, you know, $5 million valuation cap, but you sell money, you, know, you sell stock at $10 million valuation down the road, you're effectively given a 50% discount. And that's what our example will show. And you should always know that, yeah, there's a, hey, there's a valuation cap and yeah, there's a per percentage discount. So they have to, the investor has to pick and choose, right? No, what usually happens is the way these things are drafted because the investors are more savvy than that, they will say, we want our note to convert at whatever is more favorable to us. Whatever gives us a lower price per share and gets us the most shares, that is what our note will convert at or our safe will convert at. Um, so it's gonna always convert at the better for them of the discount percentage that's applied or the valuation cap. Here's a quick example. So a company raises a Series A at $20 million valuation and there's 20 million shares outstanding. So price per share is a dollar per share. With a 20% conversion discount, the conversion price per share is 80 cents, right? A dollar minus 20%, the note would convert at 80 cents per share. But hold on, there's a $10 million valuation cap. At a $10 million valuation cap, that same amount would be, you know, the shares, the 20 million shares, the $10 million valuation divided by 20 million shares will actually get you 50 cents of price per share. In that scenario, the investor is gonna convert at the cap. A 50 cent price per share is going to give them more shares. Okay, the documentation, how long does it take? So for convertible notes, it's, uh, it's uh, and we're getting close on time. So uh, I apologize. Let's see. So, oh, going back really quickly. The primary documents that you're going to have is two to three. There's a convertible note purchase agreement. And the timeline is about two to three weeks to get to closing. Safes are very close to convertible notes, except that they're not debt and they're not equity. A safe is a simple agreement for future equity. And this was actually developed by one of the incubators called Y Combinator. They have the same characteristics as debt, but um, they're not debt, so there's no interest. But there is a conversion price and there's a, and there's a valuation cap. If you can raise money on a safe, that's what's preferred from the company side. Okay, this is actually a good chart that we can kind of sit on. So uh, what are the pros and cons of various rounds of financing, right? So there's a convertible debt on the left, you got the safes in the middle, and then the Series C preferred stock uh, on the right-hand side. The biggest pros that you have with the convertible debt and the safes is that there is, it's, it's, um, it's battle-tested, people know it, People know debt more convertible debt more than they know safe, so investors might be more inclined to go on the convertible note route. Uh, but also, you don't have to buy your company very early on. With Series C preferred stock, there's a lot more documentation that goes in. You have to amend your certificate of incorporation or your charter. You're also giving up a lot of management rights, board seats, and things like that that you don't usually give in the convertible note rounds. So if you can raise your initial money, try to raise it on convertible debt or safes. Uh, this overview of preferred stock financing, Series C and Series A, we can talk about pretty quickly here, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So preferred stock is, a, uh, is another class of stock that you're going to actually authorize. Uh, so there's going to be common stock, and then there's preferred stock. Preferred stock is actually senior to uh, your common stock. So if you imagine a layer of cake, common stock would be on the bottom. That's usually what the founders hold. And then preferred stock kind of sits on the top. Preferred stock has certain rights, preferences, and privileges, uh, meaning, for example, a liquidation preference. So the investor who invests in your Series A preferred stock 
will get paid out in preference or prior to the conversion uh, or prior to the common stock if you ever sell the company. So if I sell the company for 100 million bucks uh, and all the investors have actually invested 100 million, that 100 million will go to just the investors. There'll be nothing left over to flow down to the common stock. In these next few slides, we kind of get into the nitty gritty of some of these terms. The slides are pretty self-explanatory and pretty helpful. I would I suggest you kind of go over them yourselves. I would focus more, depending on your stage of the company, if you're earlier on, on the safes and comfortable note slides. If you're you know, past that round already, or you think you can get some VC money, focus more on these Series C and Series A slides. One thing, other, another thing to point out some of these key items is that there's a, there's a detailed negotiated term sheet for your Series C and Series A. You're gonna be probably giving up some management rights because you're, you're, you're giving up ownership in the company as of that time, uh, probably a board seat. You're also gonna have to get, get uh, consent usually from the investors if you're gonna issue options or you know, raise more money or things like that. Uh, so Series C and Series A preferred stock financings are a little bit more involved. Okay, so now is the chance to ask away, uh, you know, where do I start? Which structure is best for me? How do I safeguard as best as I can? And I am supposed to pass the controls over back to the uh, folks here. And we can ask, answer some of the questions. Okay. Okay. All right, Bardia. Thank you. Uh, there's just a few questions. Uh, the first one is uh, around VCs. Do VCs typically invest in pre-revenue companies? Yeah. So that's a good question. So the Trend used to be that VCs, uh, you know, well, first of all, I guess it depends on the stage of the VC. If you're looking at a seed or early stage VC that's focused on seed and early stage companies, then the answer is typically yes. They will invest in pre-revenue companies. Um, if it's a, you know, if, if, if it's like a more mature fund that invests in later stage, they will not invest typically in a pre-revenue company. Uh, it really also depends on your industry. Are you biotech? Are you B2B SaaS? You know, what kind of company are you? Biotech, for example, doesn't have revenue for a long period of time. Uh, and there's a lot of, it's very capital intensive. So almost all the VCs invest pre-revenue. Now, if you're a tech company with, uh, with respect to VC investment pre-revenue, it, it really just depends on the market at the time as well. So if, if the company, if a VC can find a company that's similar to you, that's actually you know, post revenue, so to speak, even if it's a little bit, they're gonna edge you out rather than somebody that's pre revenue. All right, I have a question on, can you explain full dilution? Yeah, uh, full dilution. So I probably need a little bit more context for that, but <laughs> dilution, full dilution, uh, I guess the concept is essentially this. You have a, imagine you have a pie for your company stock and you have 10 million shares in that pie. So, and let's just say you've issued all that 10 million to, you know, 8 million to yourself as founders and 2 million you set aside for an option pool. Well, now you are gonna raise money from like a VC investor via an equity round. So if you're gonna raise money from an equity round, you have to actually make that pie bigger. You go back to the, to the Secretary of State and you amend your certificate of corporation, your charter, and you authorize more shares. So now your 10 million pie, let's say went up to 20 million. And let's just say that the other 10 million of this 20 million pie went to the investor. Well, now you have what's called dilution. So now instead of actually, you know, if you held, you know, 80% of the 10 million, because uh, that was the entire pie, and now you, ha you have, you know, eight, 8 million of a 20 million pie, your, your, your percentage has significantly been diluted. You went from 80% to uh, less than 50%. That's dilution. Thank you. Uh, what would you advise companies where somebody comes to them and says, hey, I can help you raise funds 
and that person says, I want to, a cut of your business. Are there any things that people should be worried about? Yeah, so that's a good question. And that's a question we kind of get pretty often. So one of the biggest things is that the SEC has rules on is surrounding what's called a broker dealer. And so if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to, I'm going to help you raise money, but I want to, you know, a percentage stake in the company in order to do so, especially if that, if that, if raising that money is a milestone for them receiving more equity or a percentage of ownership in the company, that a red flag should go off. And the first question is, hey, is this person or is this company a registered broker dealer with the SEC? If they're not, they can't do that. Uh, if they are, uh, then you can you can probably engage with them. But that's a that's a very involved question, and I would I would tell you to uh, seek seek some advice from an attorney if that does come up. Thank you. Uh, the other one was uh, around warrants, and uh, somebody was wanting to you to explain warrants and how are they used. Sure. So. Warrants. Warrants are essentially like stock options, uh, where stock options are actually issued from like a option pool to employees, consultants, uh, you know, contractors, things like that. Warrants are an analogous kind of security, similar to an option, but they don't come out of the option pool usually. They're and they're given not, not to employees or consultants. They're given to investors. So just like an option has an exercise price, and it's and you can pay a certain exercise price, let's say a dollar per share, and you can exercise that option to purchase a set amount of shares, like 20,000 shares. A warrant works the same way. So an investor might say, hey, I'm gonna invest in you via a convertible note, but I want a warrant as a kicker. I want some extra bonus. So give me this piece of paper, this contract right, for me to pay you a you know, dollar per share, and get an additional 20,000 shares of, you know, seriously preferred stock or stock through this warrant. Thank you. Uh, I think this one's a simple question. What's, a, what's the typical interest rate for venture debt presently? For venture debt, I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look because the, the market changes. I don't think it falls in the same realm of 6 to 8%. Uh, like you see for convertible notes, I think it might be actually be a little bit lower because interest rates have gone down, but it's definitely a, a, a market, you know, a day-to-day -day market term that changes. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to ask another question that I've had one of my clients ask me, or I should say uh, they were raising money. How do people get the word out that they're in the phase of raising money but not violating any of the rules. Uh, a person uh, had produced a little video chat where they were interviewing you know, somebody about their business. And by the way, they did sort of the shout out, I'm raising funds for my business, do you know anybody? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a problem? Is, uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so that's also a very good question. So what, what was just described is something called general solicitation. Uh, the SEC really does not want uh, companies going out there and like, soliciting investment dollars from the general public. Right? We talked about accredited investors versus not accredited investors. The SEC has kind of loosened its rules a little bit with respect, with respect to general solicitation, and there's some certain exemptions that now apply if you follow a certain procedure. Uh, my advice to you is, you know, be careful with what you say and who you're saying it to. And more importantly, be careful about who you're saying it to. Uh, and, you know, so what I mean by that is don't blast on your website, hey, we're looking for investment dollars. Uh, that's going to probably run you afoul of some SEC rules. My recommendation to you is get the word out, come up with a good pitch deck, with a good executive summary, hand it out to accredited investors or folks that you know are, or you would hope to know are accredited and ask your advisors to kind of spread the word for you within their kind of accredited investor circle, basically high net worth individuals or institutions that might have some interest. For now, stay away from publicly broadcasting. Thank you, always good advice. Uh, the next one, the person said, what if startups from ESOPs and co-ops, I presume they're asking if I'm an ESOP or a co-op, do I have any considerations for raising funds? 
Um, okay, let me see. So with ESOP, ESOP usually means employee stock option pool. I may have, I may have missed a part of that question. Yeah, that's what I presume they mean. Yeah, so could you just repeat that part? The, the, the question they said is, what of startups from ESOPs or co-ops? Um, if the what of is, is like, you know, should you have an employee stock option pool or a similar kind of equity incentive plan? Generally speaking, most companies do. It's, it's, it's usually the method of choice for setting aside a portion of stock so that you can issue options uh, and shares to, you know, strategic employees, consultants, board members who are coming on to help the company. Thank you. On, on safes, uh, there's always seems to be a difference of opinion depending on regions, whether safes are good or safes are not good. Where do they stand right now in the local Orange County marketplace? Yeah, so that's a good question. So safes, because they were you know, invented, so to speak, by the Y Combinator incubator up in San Francisco, I would say safes are much more prevalent up in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's flowed down the state a little bit to Orange County and San Diego down the coast, but I would still say that you know, Orange County and San Diego, uh, they are still, the investors there are still not as you know, enthusiastic about investing in the safes. Uh, they rather invest in a convertible note because they get interest and there's some other benefits of being a debt holder rather than a safe holder. There's also this concept though that you should know that might cause a shift in investors becoming more inclined to invest in a, in a safe. Y Combinator recently, I think in January of this last year, amended their safe. They put up a new form. Uh, they call, they're calling it a post money safe. This post money safe is actually a little bit more investor friendly. Uh, from a dilution perspective than the old safe form was. And so now the uh, investors that I've seen in Orange County and San Diego, they're actually, you know, they're actually more okay with investing under a safe and not a convertible note. Well, thank you very much, Bardia. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. If you're interested in no cost one-on-one -on -one consulting, Please fill out the form at SBC, sbdctech.com slash contact. If you have any other questions, please email. And the email is on the screen, which is uh, k-h-a-l-e-d-a-d-h at uci.edu. And thank you for today. Enjoy.